Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the University of Michigan Museum of Art for hosting all of us and opening the show last night with the warm talks from the curators and the museum's director. It was quite nice to see um, the camaraderie that uh, helped produce such a great show that we got to see last night. I'd also like to go ahead and thank uh, Natsu and David for their willingness uh, to always help out with all, I'm sure, all of our requests. And then we are all arrived here and we're uh, safely here today given our talks. Today my talk is divided into four, four sections. <clears throat> and these, these interrelated sections juxtapose early encounters between artists and exhibition audiences in both the East as well as the West. I begin by reviewing several key exhibitions of Asian art held in the West prior to World War II. I do so in an effort to demonstrate the historical trajectories of interest to guide, the, the demonstrate the historical tra trajectories of interest to guide the development of the Asian art history canon or canons. I will argue that these important early exhibitions were overwhelmingly interested in art from traditional, traditional dynastic periods rather than that of modern and contemporary periods. I then move on to present examples of pre-World War II exhibits that included modern and contemporary Asian artworks. In the third section, I examine artists traveling within Asia and their reasons for these travels. The fourth and final section presents some thoughts on the, on the exhibition upstairs on display here at the museum. In each of these sections, I return again and again to my crib, my crib sheet throughout my talk as it serves as a key reminder that the intent and interpretations of the artists, ex exhibitions, critics, curators, and all of us are basically multi-layered, much as uh, uh, Joanne had commented as well as Celeste about this multi the multi-being of ourselves coming to things and reacting to them and interpreting them rather than our intentions. With these, with these uh, uh, interactions and multiple uh, layers that we bring to exhibits and were put on exhibit for us, that these also in and of themselves have subtexts running alongside of how and why we react or how we see things in certain manners. Basically, we all have stories to tell, narratives that we, we judge to be true and accurate. Over time, these stories become standardized and conventional wisdom, the, canon, or the canons of art and art history. These are taken as a authorita uh, authoritative and have the power to put things into action. Again, echoing what Celeste and Joanne were talking about. So let's begin my story today and start with part one. What I begin to think about and wanted to offer is um, looking at the late 19th century through the early 20th century prior to World War II is how and why uh, exhibits were happening in Europe. I focus on London as the Burlington Fine Arts Clubs uh, was the uh, progenitor of what would become the largest exhibit ever in 1935-36 of the Chinese <laughs> art show. So with the Burlington Fine Arts Club, which, which, was, in uh, which was based in London, had exhibits from the late 19th century all the way through um, the early 20th century. These great exhibits not only focused on Japan, but also on China. They were, at the beginning, very small catalogs and then became very richly illustrated. So as early as 19, late 19th century, London was a base for collectors to start beginning to come together and show off their works. <clears throat> this is a trend we see throughout Europe in the first quarter or so, first 35 years of of European history and its uh, dealings with uh, collecting and producing exhibitions on Chinese art. In Amsterdam, the 212 exhibits, the museum put on display Chinese and Japanese as well as South and Southeast Asian artworks. Four years later in Cologne, it's much the same trajectory. We have China, Japan, South and Southeast Asia on display. Berlin, on the other hand, in 1929, Continuously, as you see, they're getting, it's tripling size, it's doubling in size, and then triples in size again in the number of exhibits. So there is an intense competition and interest amongst the nations that are collecting and exhibiting and producing canons of their own uh, uh, on Chinese art, especially, or Asian art in general. But when we get to London in the 1935-36, it's quite a, an amazing feat happens. From Neolithic to Qing works, there's a total of 3,080 exhibits on display. Over 240 governmental, institutional, and private lenders provide works to this. And with an attendance of over 400,000, 
in a very short period, given the fact that um, the king died during the exhibit, so it was a week of mourning. So they lost an entire week of exhibition, but they did not add it back into the schedule. They had over 400,000 people, but still keeps it within the top 20 exhibits of the Royal Academy's uh, most well attended. <clears throat> Any of us, I think, would be happy if we sold 108,000 108, catalogs. <laughs> so, but that's, it, it went through at least five editions, but it also had a commemorative catalog as well as uh, jur uh, a journal that went along with it. So for, for us in uh, Chinese art history, Percival David is an important collector and promoter. Uh, uh, George Mafropoulos is an important collector, and you can see his works at the British Museum as well as the V&A. And Hobson was a great collaborator with them and helped produce the, the great exhibit that, we, that I'll be talking about. In terms of thinking about how works are displayed, the, this, I just wanted to provide one installation view. It was uh, always juxtaposing ceramics, bronzes, with paintings, hung even salon style, as you can see in the background. But having 3,000 objects, if, if you've been to the Royal Academy, it had 16 galleries. So it was fairly crowded, but everything was, what that was loaned was put on display. So we have our crib sheet back here in the bottom right. We want to think about what's getting displayed and what sort of narrative is not only in the catalogs or in the journal or in the commemorative catalog, but also what are the tastes being shown, what's getting highlighted uh, in the commemorative catalog especially. Who's, who's, being, who's the author? Well, we have several authors. We have 240 lenders. Um, I'm sure David and Natsu know that by having having, uh, what, six or seven speakers call you all the time and say, oh, can I fly in this city and drive over to the other city and fly home? Those types of things, times 240, and then uh, languages from Japanese to Chinese to French to German, and from as far uh, west as Hawaii, these things all come together and became a, quite a uh, uh, experience for, say, Percival David and uh, the, the rest of the committee putting on this show. But also, who's, who's the authority? Authority is very important. Who's, who's producing? Um, I'm sure China, um, as you can see, lent almost one-third of the, uh, yeah, 32 percent of the objects come from China. They definitely have a, uh, a dog in this fight because they want to show off what is great about China. It, but again, it's not modern or contemporary, it's dynastic China they're showing off. So I think this exhibit helps us th think about, well, it, it is the largest show and it helps create a, a, the, the canon for uh, uh, Chinese art, but it has uh, these repercussions. This, these repercussions are evident because China is trying to protect itself in one view of this exhibit. It's high, it, it does fight for its um, protection of its uh, ancient objects, as you can see, several laws were passed in the in the early 30s, and it also is reacting to what's happening from Japan. Japan is already taking over uh, Manchukuo, so there is loans from Japan in this show, which was a very tricky issue to have. But in the end, the the, the committee was able to convince loans to, from Japan were, were were the right thing to do, and Japan agreed, and China again agreed to do it. But this idea of Thinking about the international exhibit of uh, Chinese art, it does give us this power to map and define and to cat categorize. There, we, each of these lenders wanted to curate a narrative. Uh, either there was archaeological work that was highlighted by the Chinese, talking about the, the great Shang Dynasty Yinshu finds, promoting their science and protection of their antiquities, as well as defining their act activities. So just think about uh, these types of issues and then keep expanding. So each of the lenders, you had an organizer, you had a collector, you have a dealer, and you have academic organizations and museums, all competing for attention and loaning the greatest objects. Uh, in regional, there is this competition. We see 200 works and 600, 1,200, 3,000 works on display. There is a competitiveness about an exhibition strategy. And China itself is the largest lender. It is the exhibit about their about Chinese art, and they, they want to make sure it's, they're demarcating not only their culture property, their excavations, but also their, their physical mapping of their, their country. 
thinking about how and why so much art is on display, um, a lot of, um, the golden age of acquiring uh, Chinese art uh, from collectors such as Freer or Sackler or um, great institutions, institutions like the British Museum, acquiring large amounts of uh, materials from China. It was a golden age once Chinese government, once the dynastic change from uh, the Qing Dynasty into the Republic. It was an open field, so to speak, for collectors to go in and take out massive amounts. So the, the, the market was very much flooded. And, uh, and in terms of the region itself, Japanese excavations uh, in northeast China were taking works back to Japan while still mapping and defining what is China. And on the global level, it's still highlighted as the largest, most complex exhibit. To think about, again, a crib sheet, just thinking about other ways to think about our existence as curators or scholars looking at um, how shows are uh, viewed. Looking at comics, just quickly, on the bottom left you see uh, art handlers uh, removing objects safely and securely, but still you have a, the European taking territories away from China, a Japanese uh, taking back some, some works, commercial rights, and in the front, monopolies in China. Another way is talking about the smash and grab idea, thinking about post-1911, China's opening up to foreigners more and more and taking objects away. Again here, there's a China shop and Japanese appropriation, that's Manchukuo. So all these things are happening, and keeping in mind our crib sheet, who's, what taste are we looking at? Who's, who's, who, who's putting what in what narrative? Who's the author of these canons? And thinking about um, what sort of agency and power the loans have, but also how the public sees them, and how it boils down to the nuts and bolts of what's really happening at a very simple comic level. And even this one, the final comic I'll show for today, was, is North China. They have maturity already, in the Japanese uh, fellow's hands, but China's, North China, you can't touch that. So thinking about trajectories and exhibits, putting London in the middle, who's, ask yourself these questions, but it, also I wanted to even expand it outside into Persia, into China. These two exhibits, 1931, sets a standardization of how the format of the catalog will be, the mapping out of the galleries, the, the small photographs for each of the individual entries and, and, hundreds and, uh, and hundreds of works being loaned. Then we see it happening um, uh, with the Chinese exhibit. But what's important to note in the archives at the uh, Royal Academy, uh, they have notes from the meetings that they were having with Japanese officials and the final, they were going to have a, uh, a great, the international exhibit of Japanese art, but as early as uh, in 36, in the notes from these meetings, you can see what's coming. All, the first to go is the uh, cultural ties to Japan are cut. There will not be this exhibit. But you see Japan, after 36, is still doing a lot with uh, Germany, so there is cultural ties. So through exhibits, you can learn a lot about cultural um, exchanges and who's, what sort of narratives are being told there or not being told there based on uh, political aspirations. Thinking about part two, I wanted to think about these early exhibits were concerned with traditional or dynastic works from China's past. Uh, thinking about modern art and looking at uh, America, th 1915 uh, in San Francisco we have uh, a unique um, show of Chinese paintings that juxtapos juxtaposes uh, uh, old and new or ancient and modern and it doesn't say, uh, uh, in the Chinese you see it says uh, the ancient and, and new, or today's. Um, and this is done by Florence uh, Asco. And this really was a single collection show from China. She was working in China as part of the, as a, a secretary, a librarian for the Royal Asiatic Society. And she made friends with uh, important people in, in the in intellectual and art, art field. And so she made friends, and she brought over th about 300 or so paintings, with 100 or so at a time being hung out of which, as you can see, most were, uh, nearly half were post uh, 19th century and with about uh, 25 or early 20th century Chinese painters. This bringing of uh, works 
to San Francisco also had um, a practical sense because they, they have arts, a, a practical arts such as ceramics and um, uh, uh, what would you say, fine crafts and items like that. But also, they, uh, a compendium to, or a, a co exhibit also brought 42 modern paintings. And one is important to note that is from uh, the, la the uh, Dowager Tsushi, and one, one uh, landscape, uh, Ho Wei Pi Pu. Uh, and I think looking at the Chinese on the, on the right hand side, you can see it's the, China, the characters on the far right. It's China and, and, and the new art, whereas China, ancient and new, rather than. Just that the, the fr framing it in Chinese language also t comes to its own uh, uh, narrative, in the sense of how they're how they're framing or defining the term modern or today's Chinese art. Since we had one exhibit view uh, from the 1935-36 show, having this earlier view from 1915 again shows this juxtaposition and hanging of objects and paintings. But now we have traditional crafts and modern crafts mixed together, and just, just showing the overwhelming way these works are held, and especially the works held, hung up so high, you're not going to be able to appreciate any brushwork or any of the details we would come to expect from viewing shows today. Again, the crib sheet asking us, who, who's putting the show on? A Western woman living in China, bringing a show to uh, America in 1915, or a Chinese-based uh, company that is promoting goods that they uh, sell, but also paintings. So they were experts in manufacturing, but not art, but they still juxtaposed it with modern uh, artists that they were, uh, hoped to represent as well. As Joanne mentioned, I, I had to, um, but she was much better at finding all the catalog images than I could because they're very, very rare catalogs. I'm, I was very happy to see those. I, was try, I, I wasn't going to be rude and take a picture, but I, those are very important uh, catalogs that you're able to find the, uh, the, the physical catalogs themselves and see how they presented them to the, 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 the works to the public. And I, I just echo up what, what she was talking about, that the first two shows, they, they failed to impress, um, but it also shows who was there. I, uh, just some of the, like Lin was there, Xu Bei Hong, um, uh, Chi Bai Xu was in the 1933. But I think the first two exhibits failed because there wasn't much support from China. They were, of course, that demonstrate there are Chinese artists abroad learning, studying, and coming together as a group, as a, as a group of artists or a coalition of artists that come together and meet and have an identity abroad. But, it does, but they were unable to get the support they needed. Um, part of the reason why that people would uh, compare and say that Chinese aren't able to compete against what we see for Japan, Japan had much more governmental support, and we'll, I'll see that we'll see a reason why in section three when I talk about it. But just the support from the government was not there for the Chinese compared to uh, what the Japanese had. And also, it didn't help that in 1925, the catalog came out uh, over halfway through the, op the show. So they missed uh, half, half the exhibit was uh, without a catalog from the Chinese side. So that, again, is detrimental to the success. Um, but the final show in 1933, um, again, a juxtaposition of old and new, um, but also the number of works. 244 paintings is a tremendous amount in any, anybody's uh, book, even today, about how many to put on display, uh, out of which 180, again, this change of the tide, or weighting the contemporary and modern works uh, to being three times as many of, uh, as compared to dynastic paintings. As um, uh, Joanne mentioned, the 33 show had both a, uh, a French and a Chinese leader of it. And so on one hand, the ancient paintings come from Paris, shows the prowess of uh, French collectors and having the Chinese side bring the contemporary works in. There's a good dialogue there about who, what, what are the tastes for the ancient paintings collected by the uh, French, but also who, what sort of canon are they trying to talk, develop or define their collections by? And who's, who's, how these things are put on display and juxtaposed. Um, it must have been a, uh, quite successful because it did tour and it did improve um, at least knowledge 
of uh, the Chinese artists, plus, as I, as I mentioned, uh, one Chibash work is included. We have redundant slides, the first two on the left, but on the right, the magpies by Chi are, are uh, I was able to find a, a very ugly online image of it. So thinking about part three, following along what I mentioned about the support Japan is having in being successful abroad, uh, I wanted a dialogue to bring in India into this conversation, but just because um, there is, within India, you have the Swadeshi movement, which basically means self-sufficient, or being self-supportive, or buy, buy local, grow local, you know, be local. And so that starts the late 19th century in India, in, most importantly in Bengal. And then in Japan, after it's forcibly opened, and in the 1850s, 1860s, the new idea about technology, westernization, scientific advancement, military, military prowess um, comes about in Japan. And in terms of how India and Japan had a uh, mutual respect or understanding, or at least sympathy or empathy, if you will, to each other, they wanted to be free from imperial powers. So there was free, frequent tra uh, travels between the countries be, uh, of artists. Um, but I just also wanted the, us to remember that um, keep our crib sheet when we start talking about uh, how and why these people are traveling and their sympathy they have to each other. So Bose is very important, uh, uh, quote unquote father or you know grand grandfather of uh, modern Indian painting, and I wanted to highlight not only his example of working in the East Asian. Uh, 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 media and technique, uh, but also we'll see the name Tagore. You're going to see many of these. Yes, they have the one brother here uh, painting in a, again, a East Asian landscape with East Asian media. Another work he has produced, as well as this one. Again, just showing that the technique is there, the expertise is there, there are exchanges, and they're mimicking or uh, grabbing everything. And um, even the, a very um, symbolic bamboo and brush strokes. And then it's just able to embody, or at least mimic, what's, what's happening um, with traditions from the, uh, East Asia down in South Asia. And it's, it's complementary. Um, you see here that Yokoyama painted in a very Indian style as well as he had relationships with the Tagore family. On the, left, on, the, on the left, we have his photograph, and then, again, another part of the Tagore family did a, did a, a drawing of him. So you have these personal relationships, but there are also these personal relationships, um, just like Dave was talking about, you, you find one person, then you start finding all the strings and who they're meeting and ramifications. So part of the group that the Tagore family was um, talking with is Akakura. And so he would come to Japan, I mean, down to India. India, uh, the Tagore family, would also um, travel to Japan. But the importance about Akakura is he goes to Boston and becomes the head of the MFA. So you're having this um, mix of uh, artists exchanging and meeting with each other from India and Japan. And then one comes to Boston and becomes the head chief curator, and of course, then our crib sheet works. Who's the, who's, who's the arbiter of taste? What sort of canon is being written? What's being collected? And who's, who's the authority? Is it a Japanese taste for East Asian art or South Asian art? Or is it a Japanese? On, all these have to be unpacked. But what's quite a lot of fun is that uh, the, um, the uncle of the Tagore brothers that had the most experience with Japan. Also, he was um, uh, a, a poet, and so he knew Noguchi's father. And there's a very public display of letters being written back and forth about how um, Noguchi's father was unimpressed with the lack of sympathy from India for, for what Japan was doing in China. Um, Noguchi the letters back and forth in 1938 talked about how China needed help and Japan was providing it. Not to worry about, of course, there's blood spill, but 
this needed to happen because um, the uh, idea, the sympathy they had about Asia being one, trying to get away from imperial um, uh, control, is that East Asia, South Asia had to rise up and become strong as the West. Um, and China needed that, so that was part of the justification for Noguchi having an argument, a very public argument, and published the letters back and forth with uh, Tagore. I wanted to end with thinking about using our crib sheet and think about what we can see upstairs. We talked about the display. Uh, meaningful to me was the first piece I walked past, and the last piece I left the exhibit last night was the, the, the work with the... Um, Mother and child, with and again written in, about and sold at auction. That he's Noguchi is very sympathetic to the Chinese cause, and he he produces he, he uh, produced the work in 1930, but then in 1938, I guess I think he, he puts it up for auction to raise funds. So that coming back to something he produced, having it inscribed in Chinese, and then selling it to benefit China against the Japanese aggression. There's a, quite a quite a sense that he's. He is curating that work. He comes back to it, and he is an artist, and it has a, a new dialogue and a new narrative that goes out and becomes uh, available in the market. And then also thinking about the juxtapositions and the works uh, Chubashi uh, gave, such as the, the inkstone for his seals, or even uh, writing, the, inscribing the works directly to Noguchi himself. There are those dialogues, there's inter-dialogues between the two, but now they're public dialogues up, up on display. And thinking about these, what's the authority we have to uh, start pulling together uh, Noguchi's father to Tagore because they have this relationship in India, what sort of exercise and what sort of benefits are we going to be able to get out of this? Um, so I just wanted to end with what we all came here to see but keep this crib note in our pockets and hopefully the trajectories we saw from the late 19th century in, in Europe to the exhibitions in Europe as well as in uh, uh, America help us to think about how and why and what kind of stories we're going to go home and tell our friends and colleagues about what we saw upstairs. Thank you.